All right. Class will come to order. It's the College of Complexes. And tonight we're going to hear about the one campaign against global poverty and disease. Uh, Kyle Demon <laughs> will be our presenter. Uh, he'll, we have PowerPoint, and uh, uh, the uh, One Campaign uh, advocates uh, for uh, better development policies, the effective aid and trade reform, uh, democracy, accountability, and transparency. Yay! Yay. Uh, that's good stuff. All right. We haven't heard the program yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing water we bought. Okay. All right. So, without any further ado, Kyle. No, no. Deming. I want further ado. Oh. <laughs> now we got to get Kyle Deming. Yay! Yay! My name is Kyle Deming, and first want to thank you all for giving me the chance to come here and talk about the One Campaign. Uh, my role is I'm a congressional district leader with the One Campaign. It's a fancy title, but I'm just a volunteer leader. Uh, this is not my day job, but it's something that I'm very passionate about. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about it tonight. All right, thank you. Is the volume here good? Yes. Yeah. Is that good? All right, great. So the one campaign to end extreme poverty, the first thing I want to talk about is what is the problem? So the problem obviously is extreme poverty. And extreme poverty is defined as living on less than a dollar and 25 cents US per day. And you can imagine how difficult it would be to survive, to thrive, to even to live, or, or to raise a family on a dollar 25 or less per day, almost impossible. And obviously with extreme poverty comes a lot of other social problems, a lot of uh, suffering. Um, people living on less than a dollar and 25 cents per day don't have access to good health care. They don't have access to give their kids an education. And when you have so little to work with, it's difficult to pull yourself out of extreme poverty uh, into being able to uh, you know, build your own wealth. And so that is the main problem that the One Campaign is trying to tackle. To give you an idea of the scope of the problem, there are uh, 1.3 billion people currently uh, that are in extreme poverty, so less than a dollar and 25 cents per day. So um, 1.3 billion people, that's about 20% of the population. So although it's not an issue that we, we probably don't know very many people that suffer from extreme poverty, the reality is that one out of five people around the globe suffers from this, uh, this terrible problem. It, it is a global problem, but there are, is a particular uh, issue in Africa which, which has a, a large number of people living in extreme poverty, about, around 400 million. And so that's why a lot of campaigns uh, that, that the One Campaign is involved with uh, particularly are trying to help bring African nations out of this state of extreme poverty. So the scope of the problem is very large, 20% of, of people around the globe living on less than $1.25 per day. Uh, which, as you can imagine, leads to a lot of suffering and a lot of unneeded death. Um, and so it seems like it might be an intractable problem. But next we want to look at what the solution is. So anything that is as large and complex as the issue of extreme poverty with affecting 20% of the globe, it's not going to be a cookie-cutter solution that's going to get the problem solved. So we need to recognize that any sort of approach we want to take is going to need to be a holistic understanding uh, of attacking a problem. Uh, it's unlikely that we're going to be able to solve extreme poverty simply by dumping money into, uh, into nations or into families in order to bring them out. It's going to involve more than that. Um, the PhD economist Paul Collier, in his award-winning book, The Bottom Billion, argues that there are four major components that go into making a solution for extreme poverty, for those that really suffer at the very, very bottom rung of the economic ladder. And that involves the four components of aid, trade, security, and governance. So unless all four of those aspects are operating in concert, it's going to be very difficult 
for these nations to drag themselves out of extreme poverty. For example, if you have lots of aid flows coming to a nation, but the governance is very bad, it's a lot of corruption in the government, it's not going to be nearly as effective uh, at solving the problem because the government's not going to serve the needs of the people. So these four different elements all need to come together uh, in a holistic approach for the solution to solve extreme poverty. So on the one hand, we need to make sure that we don't think that it's simply a matter of dumping more money into the problem. On the other hand, we need to recognize that aid is still an important part of the solution. So we can't discount the, the value that aid does bring towards solving extreme poverty. Um, but right now I'd like to address, I think there are two major myths that a lot of Americans especially hold about extreme poverty. Uh, the first myth is that there's a huge amount of the U.S. budget that goes towards foreign aid. And the second myth is sort of related, which is that, you know, we've already heard that this is still a big problem. It seems intractable. intractable. And so the thought is that, well, if we're dumping so much money into it and it's still such a huge problem, then apparently it's not working. So it's kind of a dual myth that there's a huge amount of investment in foreign aid uh, as a share of the uh, U.S. budget and that it's not really working or doing anything. And so I'd like to really address both of those concerns. Uh, concerning the first, what I would say is a myth, uh, in the reality, the U.S. budget uh, only allocates less than 1% towards these foreign aid uh, programs. So more than 99% of the U.S. budget is not towards foreign aid. Um, a lot of Americans actually assume that it's more in the 25% range. And so that's obviously a pretty significant difference. Uh, and you can see that even, uh, you know, even if you took away the entire slice of pie that is aid, it would not make a, a significant or huge dent in things like the, the debt problem and the deficit and so forth. So, although foreign aid is oftentimes considered to be sort of a scapegoat, something that we can, you know, maybe we can cut that and then we can solve all of our, all of our fiscal problems. The reality is that because it's really just a small part of the budget, uh, it's really not the first place to look when it comes to, you know, cutting programs in order to try to solve the deficit and so forth. Um, so that's the first, the first myth I'd like to dispel. There's really not a huge percentage of the U.S. budget going towards foreign aid programs. But what about the progress? So granted, we've got 1% of the budget going towards these programs, but they, do they do anything? If they didn't do anything or if they made the problem worse, then no matter how small it is, you should still take away that piece of the pie. Um, so I'd like to address the, the progress that we have made in the fight against extreme poverty. I think it's very easy for us to uh, kind of get a little bit defeatist about this issue. We hear the big statistics that there are, are still 1.3 billion people uh, suffering from extreme poverty. And it, it just sounds like, well, how could we ever solve that problem? So I want to sort of show um, some of the, some of the sm smaller wins we've made and also the major progress that the world has made together in attacking this problem of extreme poverty. So as mentioned, it's a small slice of the budget, has a large impact. So I'm going to look at four individual case studies here. Um, first is that there's more than 8 million people that are now on life-saving HIV AIDS uh, medicine, which is up from 400,000 in 2003. Another thing that I think is really critical about AIDS medication is that uh, if, if pregnant mothers are treated with antiretroviral drugs, then it makes sure that the, the HIV AIDS does not pass to their children. And so uh, that's another major part of the HIV AIDS campaign is to make sure that there's no transmission from mother to child. And that's been extremely successful. And we're looking towards the goal of having no child born with HIV AIDS uh, by 2015. Uh, over the last decade, uh, 50 million more children are going to school for the first time. Uh, schooling is a tremendously important issue because kids who are well educated are able to uh, get better jobs, are able to contribute to the economy and to pull themselves up out of poverty themselves uh, through, through their knowledge and through the ability to apply skills and, uh, and their labor. So education is a critical component of uh, ending extreme poverty and over the last decade we've seen massive improvements in, in this. Uh, malaria has been cut in half in uh, seven African countries since 2000. It's hard to describe how terrible of a problem malaria is. It's uh, killed, I believe, more than 600,000 people per year. So uh, the disease is largely stamped out, virtually non-existent in the United States. But it is a huge problem in some regions still, and it's a major killer, especially of young kids. Uh, however, we've made major progress against malaria. And it really is a fairly easy disease to stamp out for several uh, different mechanisms. So uh, it's great that we've made tremendous progress there, but there's still a lot of progress to be made. And then the fourth issue is that uh, polio has been nearly eradicated. There's only three endemic countries uh, that still house uh, uh, polio. My, uh, my grandfather actually suffered from uh, polio. Uh, but now we are almost on the verge of being able to stamp this disease out completely. 
And uh, once you do that, then you have even less need to uh, develop fiscal resources towards treating and taking care of people with polio. So when you, when you stamp out diseases completely, it can actually have a long-term fiscal benefit and make it easier to support your societies. Okay, so we looked at four kind of case studies here. I actually want to show a brief video um, put on by uh, Bill and Melinda Gates. Uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was one of the organizations that co-founded, or got one started in the beginning in 2005. I want to start by showing you what I think is the most beautiful picture I've ever seen. Yep, it's the chart. I think this is one of the greatest accomplishments of the last hundred years. Vaccines are great investment. A modest investment in a vaccine helps save the high cost of treating that person for the rest of their life. So in the long run, we also know that healthy children grow up to be much more productive. Over the last 50 years, we have had a revolution in food production. Your money is saving lives every single day. In the area of malaria, 122 million bed nets have been distributed. When aid is focused on poor people, when aid is done properly, it works. Even though these are tough economic times, the overall trend is that the world is improving by so many measures. When you find a leverage point that's this powerful, we should do more of it. We should give it all we've got. This video just uh, compiled a few of the, main, of the many uh, statistical uh, great news stories that have come out of the last couple decades of work in the fight against extreme poverty. And uh, so we've looked at kind of some case examples, but I want to kind of draw this into the bigger picture. Uh, when I s started this talk, it might have sounded that we have an intractable problem on our hands. 1.3 billion people in extreme poverty. Doesn't sound like we're going to be able to make much of a dent. But the reality is that in the last 20 years, we've actually had a reduction by 50% in the number of people suffering from extreme poverty. So it's been cut in half because of many efforts over the last 20 years. Uh, this is not solely due to aid, but aid is a key component of this overall massive reduction in the amount of suffering caused by extreme poverty. So I think that it's very important to recognize that we have made great progress. This can be maybe a little bit uplifting, that we don't have to think that this will never be a thing of the past, but in fact, we are making great progress through uh, the techniques that we're using currently uh, to solve this problem. And uh, I'd encourage you, if you're interested in this sort of thing, to uh, check out livingproof.one.org for more of these uh, statistics uh, and studies showing the massive reduction in suffering and in extreme poverty we've had over the past couple decades. In fact, our progress has been so great that uh, it's increased the ambition of our goals. And uh, so next I want to really talk about the goals. What's next uh, for the fight against extreme poverty? And this is extremely ambitious and it might sound a little crazy, but I'm all about big, hairy, audacious goals. And the plan that we'd like to achieve is zero or near zero poverty by the year 2030. And like I say, this might sound like a pipe dream, um, but given the extent of the progress we've already made and how, how much we've improved in our knowledge and our understanding of how to stamp out extreme poverty, uh, this is a, a realistic goal if we continue to apply strong efforts towards this cause. Uh, the Brookings Institute uh, put out a study about uh, sh you know, showing the progress we've made here and what the possibilities are for the future. Over here at the top, um, over here in 1990, this is at a 40 plus percent rate of extreme poverty. And getting to the modern day here, as we've seen, this is down below 20 percent. That's that reduction by 50 percent that I was referring to. And this part of the chart shows the likely trend and then the possibilities of where this trends could leave depending on what we do. And as you can see, there's a large difference between the worst case scenario and the best case scenario. The best case scenario gets us almost to the eradication of extreme poverty by 2030. Whereas the worst case scenario basically involves leveling out 
and not seeing much reduction from what we have currently. Uh, so I do think that this study goes to show how critical of a time we are living in right now. We could see the reduction of extreme poverty to almost zero in 15 years, or we could, uh, or 20 years, I mean, or we could basically stall out and uh, not make much progress. So I think that the time is to act is now. We need to make sure that we keep the pressure on the fight against extreme poverty. Uh, and, but I do want to once again uh, raise the optimism that there is an end in sight if we continue to apply pressure against the problem of extreme poverty. So that was an overview of the, the problem, uh, of the solution as we see it, and also the goal that we'd like to achieve. I'd like to go now a little bit more in depth about the role of the One Campaign. I'm here to discuss what the One Campaign is doing in the fight against extreme poverty and how you could possibly get involved. Now, the One Campaign doesn't actually take donations. We don't want your money. I do think that uh, it's very important and, and, um, and morally sound to invest your own um, charitable dollars in organizations that are working around the globe to solve extreme poverty. There's a number of great organizations, UNICEF, uh, World Vision, Oxfam, a number that take donations and do great work with that in saving lives. But the One Campaign is structured a little bit differently because we're an advocacy organization. So we're not accepting money, we, are just, we just actually want your voice. So the One Campaign essentially raises public awareness and, uh, and pressures political leaders to support effective programs that uh, deliver real results in the fight against extreme poverty. And it's a nonpartisan uh, advocacy organization and uh, actually is three million members strong. And the strength in numbers here is what I think is uh, very encouraging because due to the large numbers that the One Campaign has been able to attract, uh, it's now more, more, uh, more effective than the sum of its parts because now we have three million members in this highly organized campaign uh, that can really apply a lot of political pressure and make sure that we kind of hold politicians' feet to the fire. Uh, Sometimes, you know, cutting foreign aid might be might seem like an easy thing to do. It might be kind of an easy out for a lot of politicians, unless they're getting pressure from people that do care about these issues and they don't want to see the results, uh, the negative results would happen if foreign aid programs are drastically cut. So, the large membership of the One Campaign is an extremely important part, I think, of its effectiveness as an advocacy organization. And if you'll bear with me, I have one more video to show um, that just goes over the a uh, little bit of what the One Campaign has done in, the, in uh, the last few years uh, since it was uh, founded. Combine the power of numbers with some, you know, with 
celebrity activism and, and other methodologies to make sure that there's a there's a large organization making sure that there is pressure on political leaders uh, to take a stand against extreme poverty and to make sure that this is the generation in which we wipe out this uh, tremendous problem from the globe. So. Uh, I'd like to give a brief overview of how one's advocacy efforts work in uh, five different steps. Um, the first is that if you decide to become a one member, um, you become a volunteer. You could you can really volunteer at different levels of engagement. So, for example, I'm a congressional district leader, so I'm fairly involved. But not everyone needs to be as involved as I am in these causes because the one campaign is able to easily reach out to all the members in its group and deliver actions that they can take uh, quickly and easily uh, to, make a, to make a change and to advocate on behalf of these issues. So the first step is that you choose to become a one member in some capacity. Uh, the second step is that one helps join your voice and actions with other people like you from across the country and the globe. And this once again gets back to that idea of the scope and the scale of the organization with three million members strong and growing. At least to the third step, because one campaign is so large and organized it's able to ensure that policymakers respond to this huge army of uh, supporters of the One Campaign. Uh, and these members of the campaign are providing uh, pressure information for ideas on how to end extreme poverty, uh, policy ideas and so forth, and just basically making sure that politicians realize that citizens do care a lot about these issues. Um, the, then the fourth step is that through, the, through those actions of policymakers, uh, working together, we're able to help increase access to education, health care, good governance, aid, and so forth in the uh, world's poorest nations. And then the fifth step, uh, you know, challenges continue uh, to come up, different issues continue to be raised. Thankfully, there's a great organizational structure with the One Campaign that helps to make sure that, uh, that all the members know about the most important pressing political issues. Um, sometimes things are, you know, very... Uh, very timely as far as new bills that are introduced and so forth. And the one campaign makes sure that all members of the campaign know, uh, you know, what is most important and critical to address at this time. So that's an idea of how one's advocacy model works. And so next, I'd like to let you know what you could do if this is something that you're passionate about. If you agree that stamping out extreme poverty uh, through these uh, effective development programs is something that you'd like to support and get behind with your advocacy. So uh, there's a few different methods that one, the One Campaign applies to keep the political pressure on and to make sure that the uh, most effective policies are written. Um, it all comes back to your messages. So your messages are what lets political leaders know that people care about these issues. Uh, at the end of the day, politicians are in the business of getting reelected, and they, didn't know, they need to know what their constituents care about. And so by sending messages in whatever form, you let them know that there, there would be consequences if they're not living up to their end of the bargain as far as supporting policies that you care about. So your messages lead to effective policy, which leads to funded programs, and then to lives saved. And so that's the model. A couple different things that could be done uh, that the One Campaign regularly does, uh, writing a letter uh, to your uh, senator or your congressperson, uh, making a phone call to the district office. You can uh, go to a town hall meeting. You can uh, visit your representatives in district. Uh, you can also apply what you know through the One Campaign to your, your voting. So there's a lot of different ways that you can reach out and make your, your influence uh, felt by political leaders. A few tips about effective advocacy uh, within the One organization. Um, knowing your facts is always very helpful. So. It's another great value of the One Campaign is that it provides a lot of information to members about the facts of important issues. Uh, and I think this is extremely important to know what you're talking about, of course, uh, when you're advocating. Um, staying on message is, of course, an important thing to do uh, when you're advocating for a particular cause. Uh, making it personal if possible is uh, oftentimes more effective. Uh, than just simply uh, going with stats. I'm a little bit of a stats junkie, and so I probably tended to use more statistics and, and charts than uh, some would, but uh, making things personal can be very effective at conveying a good message. It's great if you can avoid being partisan. One of the great advantages of the One Campaign is that it is a nonpartisan organization, and this really is an issue that has bipartisan support. Um, both on the right and the left, there are many that are very passionate about the issues of foreign development, and people on both sides of the political aisle recognize how important these programs are. Uh, 
And so there's no need to be too partisan uh, when we're advocating for the issues of ending extreme poverty. Uh, requesting a response is always great if you can get some sort of response back um, from political leaders or the staff members. And then finally, recruiting others, so letting other people know. Uh, that's, I guess, what I'm doing here today. Um, but obviously, as the numbers grow and as more people are aware of the issues and are acting out on the issues, it's going to have a bigger and bigger impact on the political leaders. To make it a little simpler, uh, I'd uh, advise you, if, if this is something that you're interested in, to go to one.org. You can click on a button that says Take Action in the upper right-hand corner of the web page. And this will get you started with uh, campaigns that we're currently working on, on issues that we think are very important in the fight against extreme poverty. And, uh, and then you can sign up for the email and so forth to get more uh, news and information about campaigns as they come around. And then there's also something that you can do tonight. So um, during the uh, question and answer period, uh, we're going to be passing out um, some sample letters and some blank sheets of paper so that you could write a letter to your representative. Uh, let them know that you care deeply about the funding for programs that help eradicate extreme poverty around the globe. If this is something that you're passionate about, then they should know. And so we have provided an opportunity for you tonight to take this action. And we'll make sure that these are delivered to uh, the representative. So uh, we'll be passing this out, like I said, during the uh, question and answer period. Yeah. But uh, I want to get to questions here pretty soon. So I just wanted to say thank you for the chance, once again, to uh, talk to you about uh, this, uh, the One Campaign. And I do appreciate the opportunity. As Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done. And I know I've, we've talked about some pretty ambitious goals, hopefully ending extreme poverty or bringing it to near zero by the year 2030. Uh, it does always seem impossible until it's done. Uh, but now is the time to act. We've already made great progress. Uh, the amount of unneeded human suffering caused by extreme poverty has been reduced greatly. And if we continue our efforts, then uh, we'll see in the next 15 to 20 years an even more radical decrease in the number of people who die needlessly from uh, the scourge of extreme poverty. So, with that being said, I'd like to open right. up for questions. Brown will be directing it, but... Uh, yes, Tim, I see as a question, and also... Margaret. Uh, Don and uh, Judy. And, and Margaret. Margaret. And Margaret. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So we'll start okay. Can you uh, uh, comment? A lot has changed in the world, particularly with the spread of information technology, globalization, and other trends. Has there been a correlation between the reduction of poverty and the spread of these trends? And is part of it as a result of the reduction of these trends, or is it despite these trends? Yeah, absolutely. There has been a great trend um, in the increase in technology and globalization, and these are certainly key factors in the re reduction in extreme poverty we've seen. And so that's why I do want to be more subtle, to, not to say that uh, aid is the only thing that is causing this massive improvement that we've seen. Uh, it's part of the puzzle, but certainly globalization, technology, uh, improvements in agricultural technology, improvements in uh, communications, like you mentioned, are a huge part of uh, the fight against extreme poverty. And so research and development also in, in medical technology and in, and in communication technology, et cetera, is also a key factor, I think, at getting us to, to zero. Thanks. Okay. Yes, um, next, uh, Judy. I'm wondering if, what, if we actually get to speak to these representatives and senators in person, how do we handle the eventual challenge? Well, if you also want domestic social programs like Medicaid, well, Medicaid or, or an aid? I do think that it comes back to the issue of the size of uh, the budget that is going towards a foreign aid programs. I think it's important to uh, emphasize that it is a small piece of the pie. And um, oftentimes we're advocating simply not to cut these programs. Um, it's such a small part that it wouldn't really solve deficit problems, things like that anyway. Uh, so I, I do think that mentioning that, hey, this is a real small proportion of the budget. We think that this is an important issue uh, and should, should still be, uh, you know, addressed. Does, does that answer your question? Not really, especially since even if you say, well, it's only 1% of the budget, mm -hmm. 
they will still argue with you about you have to choose because we all have to make choices because we I think some of the certain people want to go into an austerity budget which, which means nothing other than what is really needed. Sure. So um, actually, am I able to get this um, back on? Is that yeah, okay? that's fine. I just turned it off because I thought you were done. That's oh, all. understood. I did have a couple extra slides. Oh, sure. Sorry about that. Oh, no, not from. God. Okay, I, I had a question. Um, now, the four things you mentioned in your presentation yes. were that, that there were four means to end poverty A, trade, governance, and security. And you, now, uh, you explained pretty well what, what A uh, would be. Yes. And you, you and I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on what one's, uh, one's position is on the subject of trade and governance. I, I turned it off, you did but say we'll get it back that, on. Excuse me, Tim, would it be possible for me to talk without being interrupted? Uh, uh, now, uh, you did say that. Um, that trade, governance, and security. And you did talk in terms of governance about good, about you know having good government. Yes. But I was wondering if you could get a little bit more into the specifics about what what one is advocating. And also, what is what is one's position on the subject of trade? And also, what does one mean by security? And, and what what's what's that all about? Sure. So uh, trade is very critical because uh, trade allows obviously for economies to develop domestically and. So that way, the, the economies and, and people can kind of, in a certain sense, pull themselves up by their bootstraps. One of the biggest problems that many African economies face is a lack of trading partners. And uh, so the one campaign in general would advocate for open trading policies with Africa. There are several um, bills also that address uh, specific, um, specific uh, like encouragements for uh, businesses to invest in Africa. And uh, we would support those sorts of things because trade is ultimately going to do a lot of good for African economies. Uh, in fact, really, the amount of, of money that uh, an African nation can get from trade uh, can far exceed what they're going to get from aid flows, um, especially if uh, they have they discover uh, good natural resources that can that can be traded uh, for significant economic development. What's that? No, wait, yes. Yes. Can you explain a little bit more about what, what, is, what is meant by the term security and what is, uh, and what is one's position on that? One does not have a particular position, as far as I'm aware, on security issues. Security issues have more to do with uh, uh, civil wars and uh, possible in, uh, interventions or uh, peace actions, uh, either by a nation or hopefully by the United Nations. Uh, one campaign usually does not take a, a stance on, for example, we do not take a stance on the issue of Syria and so forth, um, because those are very controversial issues and we prefer to focus on the aid uh, aspect. But uh, I was simply mentioning the, those four issues uh, in relation to Paul Collier's argument about the most effective way to bring countries out of extreme poverty. So, um, you know, I guess I would say that what the policies are as far as security and possible foreign interventions would be unrelated to the work that one is doing, but it is an important component of you know, solving some of these uh, the problems for really poor nations that are suffering from like civil wars and so forth. Basically, the, the argument is that a country can't really develop very well economically when they're suffering from you know, uh, civil wars and things like that. Okay, Margaret? Uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's Military aid to other countries included in foreign aid, what percent? The, the, the amount, the statistics that I gave you did not include military. Um, sometimes the way that the stats are shown, it uh, you might hear a statistic around 1.6%, and that does include, say, military aid, uh, largely to Israel. Uh, but that was actually taken out of uh, the considerations that I had in, in the presentation here. So realistically, the budget of actual foreign aid programs that are not military related is about, uh, I believe, 0.6 to 0.8 percent. And I have another, a second question. Is that, um, is any of the things that uh, your chart about how the thing was, uh, how the poverty was going down in the future, is that going to take into effect the effects of global warming on things like the rising sea levels and people uh, being forced inland and 
food production. Uh, and food production uh, and, uh, and that, you know, that agricultural has to change and all those things. That's a good question. I'm not sure if that was part of the Brookings Institute study. I'd have to look into that more. But I do agree that uh, considerations of of climate and, and, and agriculture and so forth is, is critical. So that has to be part of the solution as well. I do know that as far as the um, you know, the Millennium Development Goals are um, going to be coming up to an end here pretty soon in 2015, and I do know that a lot of the, uh, the international efforts towards ending extreme poverty now are very much more conscious of the importance of, of climate as far as um, you know solving the issue of extreme poverty. Because climate change oftentimes actually impacts uh, countries that are mired by extreme poverty worse than others. And so I think that it has to be an important consideration. I, I must admit, though, I'm not sure if that was included in the Brookings Institute analysis. But I could look into that and get back to you. Uh, so you want to speak? Scott. Yeah, I was going to. Are you? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm Scott. Um, I'm a teacher, and some of my former students here. But um, you were asking about the foreign aid uh, budget. It's roughly uh, 12 billion a year, and out of that, um, one one third of it goes for military spending. It's a billion, half of that is billion for Israel, and a billion for Egypt for the Camp David peace process. So you're talking about maybe eight billion across the world in foreign aid, and you compare that to the Pentagon budget, which is a third of the American, you know, budget of it's 660 billion. This, this current shutdown that we had last two weeks, we um, more or less wasted 25 billion. So we could have tripled our foreign aid budget if we could have saved that money and sent it to the right place. And also, you, you're looking at uh, what they call economists call opportunity costs. You know, things that uh, you don't do and you lose the opportunity. You know, like in an investment. Now, this is like an investment in the future also, um, but with um, these populations of people, or maybe in the long run, you know, it will reduce the likelihood of conflict, armed conflict in the long run. You know, when people are scrounging for the bare minimum of resources to survive, you know, it's more likely that they would act out in a violent manner, you know, in a you know, survival mode. And um, also, um, one last thing I was going to say, too, is uh, the whole U.S. budget is roughly $1.4 trillion. And you're talking about, you know, $8 billion out of that going to foreign aid that, you know, foreign aid that does, you know, good, which is, you know, half of 1%. So it's a, it's a drop in the bucket. You know, I mean, they spend that much basically on interest and the debt that we owe every week. And uh, one last thing, food for thought, is, you know, the flight... These guys hate this, but the flying wing, the B-2 stealth bomber, one of them cost two and a half billion dollars. One. So, you know, maybe we can build one less, have maybe less people to bomb in the future, and help some people, you know, help some people out in the long run. So that's, that's one of the legends. You know that. So if you talk to the congressman, yeah. So I do also want to address a little more deeply this issue of, okay, so shouldn't we focus on our own problems? I did prepare a few arguments to raise uh, counter to this concern. And it's a three-pronged argument. I do think this is important because it's the number one issue that comes up when the question of foreign aid and how we should allocate our budget is raised. Um, the first argument I would make is actually a moral argument. So this might not be politically relevant, but I do think that it's important for us to consider morality when we make our decisions. And if you agree, then I think you can make a fairly straightforward argument that we should support foreign aid uh, when possible, as long as it does not incur extremely negative benefit or extremely negative consequences to us. So the argument would go like this. If I can save someone's life without incurring significant self-sacrifice, I should do so. And this intuition could be supported, for example, with a case uh, example. Let's say that you're passing by a shallow pond and you notice an infant that is struggling in the pond and is going to drown unless you uh, go into the pond and save it. However, by doing so, you're going to soil your $50 pants and uh, this would bring you massive inconvenience. I think that most of us would recognize that the, the <laughs> take your pants off, <laughs> indeed. Uh, most of us would recognize that 
we should go into the pond and save the infant, uh, despite the fact that it's going to incur some uh, negative consequences to us. So if that, if that can be granted, then I think the premise here can be granted that um, we should save someone's life if it does not incur significant self-sacrifice. Uh, the second premise would be that supporting government foreign aid policies can save someone's life without entailing significant self-sacrifice. Um, I've already argued here today that, uh, that these programs do work and do have a, a significant impact on saving lives. And I would also then argue that it does not cause a significant self harm to support these policies because since it's only 1% of the budget, uh, for, you know, frankly, even if you're considering this from a tax perspective, uh, it's not going to save you much taxes if they were to eliminate it completely, not even to solve the deficit problem, but to take away your taxes. So it's not going to have significant self-sacrifice, so that would be the second premise. The third premise, therefore, I should support government foreign aid policies. So I think we have here a, a pretty good moral argument that we should support these policies um, unless it could be proved that they have significant uh, negative consequences for ourselves or others. The uh, second argument that I would make is an economics one. So, um, as the maybe somewhat trite saying goes, a rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, so the American economy does benefit from improved economies as sources of trade. Uh, Africa is actually home to six of the t top ten fastest growing economies in, uh, in the world, and the U.S. exports to Sub-Saharan Africa now uh, top $21 mil uh, billion dollars a year. So the argument here would be that further improvements of African economies will actually create more opportunities for American economic growth. Moreover, um, getting back to the issue of technological change that we addressed actually a little bit earlier, um, healthy economies also produce technological change, innovations and so forth, that drive the world forward. So many of the most important medical advances, technological advances, and so forth come from developed countries. The more developed, uh, highly well-functioned countries we have, the more sources of innovation and technological improvement we have. So I think that this would actually benefit the entire world, not just the United States, to have more healthy economies. And if you'll bear with me, I have a third argument, which is the national security argument. So international development uh, is an important factor in improving our national security. Uh, both the Bush and Obama administration have argued that the threats over the next two decades facing the United States were, quote, less from conquering states uh, than from failing ones. So our concern is not so much uh, that there's other superpowers out there that are going to take us down. Uh, most of our problems come from failing states. If you look at Al-Qaeda, they were given refuge in three failed states, uh, Somalia, Sudan, and Afghanistan. Uh, so many, uh, or, uh, many national security leaders recognize that uh, international development actually is a national security concern. And so I think that these three reasons give us a good, a good cause for us to support foreign aid, um, even if it does, you know, it, it is a part of our budget, and even if we're facing hard economic times, uh, foreign aid might not be the best thing to cut. Okay. Uh, Ted Miranda. Yeah, um, does, is one an acronym for something, or does it mean anything in particular? It is not an acronym. Uh, as far as I understand, the concept is just the idea of bringing everyone under one voice and you know, gathering people from different walks of life and so forth into a single cause. Okay, another question. You didn't quite answer that gentleman's uh, question about <clears throat> governance. What exactly is one doing about uh, governance in other countries? I, I imagine that uh, uh, inequality of wealth and power is one of the main causes of, of poverty in many countries. And the U.S. is supporting uh, austerity, uh, you know, inducing governments all over the world, dictatorships all over the world. Uh, is that something that you would address, that one would address? Um, actually, I guess, Sivanko, if you could help me answer this question. I'm really not sure if the One Campaign has a, a major uh, amount of to say about the government's question, uh, or if it mostly focuses more on the aid issue. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Sviatko. I, I actually work for the One Campaign. I'm the original. Um, organizer, the original co-director for this area. Um, so we encourage good governance and transparency um, on the side of, uh, you know, the um, American government and, and, and policies that we engage in, but as well um, in Africa and, and nations that, that, that we support and the private sector as well. Um, so I guess the transparency piece when it comes to, um, to governments um, is, is very important in, in ensuring good governance. Um, and, and South Africa actually uh, was mentioned earlier is one of the most transparent, uh, has one of the most transparent governments um, uh, in, in the world. So that's, uh, that we feel is very, uh, a very important part of that argument. Um, I don't know if there's specific policies, being an advocacy organization, I am not sure if there's a specific policy that we, um, 
that we have tried to push uh, support for in the past, we can uh, uh, try and find out and, and get back to you on that. So I'll make sure that um, I get your information. Okay. So you have no uh, program to uh, reduce uh, inequality of wealth and power in, in other countries at this moment? Uh, well, our, our hope is that through um, investing in programs that are addressing, um, you know, health, education, those are kind of, you know, prerequisites to ensuring that you have strong economies where the power of, uh, the balance of power is, is uh, uh, exists. One other very quick question. Um, I'm very skeptical that uh, you all are reducing poverty in, the, in around the world. As a matter of fact, my impression is that poverty is spreading around the world. There are vast shanty towns all over the world, including many in Africa. Uh, people are driven off the land. Uh, again, austerity has been driving a whole lot of people off the land. You might be cutting, I don't know if you are cutting uh, uh, some manifestations of extreme poverty. Uh, some of them might be uh, uh, being reduced, like uh, polio, uh, HIV, whatever. But that, that's not the same as reducing poverty in general. People can be not dying from HIV or polio, but still be extremely poor, and in fact, increasing in poverty around the world. By, by extremely poor, though, are you referring to um, above the threshold of extreme poverty we talked about of $1.25 a day? Because obviously you could still, you could be at $3 a day, and that's still very, very yeah, poor. Yeah, that's my point. Yes. That's my point. So you might not be reducing poverty at all around the world. Uh, you might just be reducing the direst uh, uh, um, poverty. And, and as I said, I don't see any evidence that you, one, is doing this you know, single-handedly. Yeah, and and we're not uh, we're not claiming to be doing this single-handedly. I mean, there is a co there there is a, a coalition of organizations that um, that are very similar to one that focus on, on similar issues, and we wouldn't be able to tackle this problem alone. Uh, so there is a number of organizations, foundations, um, you know, governments that are helping tackle these issues, um, and there is uh, measurable. Uh, proof that um, the number of people living in extreme poverty has been half um, over the past 20 years, as, as Cal had mentioned in his presentation. Uh, so um, I would argue that we have seen successes um, on that front, and we believe things are improving when it comes to you know the number of uh, of children dying of preventable diseases, the number of uh, um, of children in school, the number of um, you know mothers dying in childbirth, the mother, the, the number of children getting sick with uh, the HIV virus at birth. Uh, we've seen very uh, measurable results that have shown tremendous progress when it comes to, to these type of issues. So I would argue that our efforts along with those of other organizations combined um, are making a significant um, progress. Okay, Charles? Yeah, uh, can the simplest thing be to kick out the multinational corporations that are operating with impunity in these countries. I showed a video here about Nestle using children to, to make chocolate chocolate bars. Uh, and this free market capitalism. Uh, is, these people are not going in there to help them out. I absolutely agree that multinational corporations uh, need to be addressed as an issue. Uh, one of our partner organizations, Oxfam, who's actually a, a, yeah. one of the founding partners, um, has worked quite a bit on the, on the Nestle issue in particular and on other brands that are using abusive uh, labor practices and uh, land grabs and things like that. Um, it is definitely an issue that also needs to be addressed, I agree. Yes, uh, Russell? Yeah, it's your and take out the multinationals, could you end up making the poverty even worse? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't actually advocate for a policy of kicking out multinationals, but I think uh, greater transparency would be the, the, the key improvement that could be made there. Yeah. the best way to end poverty is with a job. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, economic development, especially yeah. if it can be produced domestically, is super important. Yeah, for all children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah.
How do you tackle extreme economic inequality? Yeah. In, in, because there are other examples like that. I think uh, Central African um, Republic is another one. And, and there is uh, South America. I mean, there are a lot of those kind of examples where, you know, you got an oligarchy of two, three, four families and uh, don't, don't, don't think they're going to give up their booty. Right, absolutely. And, well, and that is why I have tried to advocate for a holistic and multivariate approach to solving the problem. And governance is an extremely important issue. Um, unfortunately, to a certain extent, that can always be, can't always be controlled. We can just do the best we can with our policies to try to encourage good governance. Uh, Sivako mentioned transparency and initiatives to force governments to be more transparent in order to take advantage of, say, global opportunities uh, of trade and so forth uh, could be things that could, that could help. Um, so I think that we need to continue to work on the, the governance problem um, along with the issue of you know, aid deliverance and, and other issues. Unfortunately, I think our government likes it that way because it's so easier to deal with two families than a Congress. Sure. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I do think that's where uh, political advocacy becomes important uh, because if, if the politicians realize that their job is on the line possibly because people really do care about issues, say, of uh, enforcing good governance rather than allowing those kind of situations to continue, then you might be able to see some change. But unless, unless you apply pressure to the politicians, uh, you know, if they're in a situation that they like that is good for them, probably nothing is going to change. So I would say that you know, change has to come from the ground up um, and on political pressure p placed on politicians to make sure that uh, they're not encouraging these kind of policies. Now, does it or associated organizations can tackle that kind of problem? Yeah, I mean, there are associated organizations. Like I mentioned, uh, one does focus a lot on the aid and the, the foreign aid uh, issue, uh, but there's a ton of organizations that are doing great work when it comes to advocacy. Um, and so, if you know, you could also support organizations that are doing a lot of work in the issue of ensuring good governance. But, uh, I mean, this is just part of the technical problem that needs to be solved in order to uh, eliminate extreme poverty is the governance issue. Whoever's solving the problem is just something that needs to be addressed. I would mention, though, that uh, there's no necessary reason to be completely, um, to be, you know, depressed about the, the prospects because not every uh, country that is suffering from extreme poverty has terrible governance. Uh, and, in fact, there has been a lot of strides in the improvement of African governance um, over the past couple of decades as well, which has also uh, produced some of the gains that we've seen in the reduction of extreme poverty. So um, it does need to be an analyzed on a case-by-case -case basis. Even if you had a government that was so corrupt that it was literally impossible to improve the situation on the ground for the people, uh, at the worst case scenario, I would say that that would be an argument not to, to give aid flows to that particular country, but it would mean that we should stop or hamper the aid program uh, across the globe. We need to be, you know, very specifically focusing on individual countries uh, rather than, you know, generically worried about the issue of, of governance. David Travis. Uh, you mentioned something to the fact that uh, one plans to wipe out poverty by 2030. Yeah, I do want to clarify that it's not. It's not one's claim that, uh, and maybe this did not come off the right, the right way, I tried to make it clear that, um, and I probably failed to do so, that one is just simply one organization working on this issue. Uh, the goal to end extreme poverty by 2030 is, um, is not particularly made by the one campaign, but we are on board with, with these kind of global efforts for that, for that goal. With that in mind, if uh, poverty is eliminated by 2030 or 2040 or 2050 or whatever. Sure. <clears throat> Inasmuch as Jesus Christ said the poor will always be among us, <laughs> then wouldn't that completely refute Christianity and overthrow it as a, as, as a uh, <laughs> to be true? Well, I am a uh, Christian, and so actually I would hope that it means that the uh, second coming is happening before we end extreme poverty. So hopefully by 2030, uh, we'll be all set. So, um, <laughs> and it is true, I am, I am a, a Christian, and I agree that Jesus said that the poor will always be with you. And it is one reason that I'd like to focus on the issue of extreme poverty. Um, we're talking about less than a dollar and 25 cents per day 
Uh, that is not, just if we wipe that out, that does not mean we've wiped out poverty. Poverty will always be with us. There will always be people that have less uh, than others and significantly less. And that is still a problem, but the problem that I'm focused on, that we're focused on here, is extreme poverty. Um, but by no means does the wiping out of extreme poverty mean the wiping out of poverty in general. Um, just that if you were on, living on $3 US a day, uh, you're still not in uh, terrific economic shape. So, uh, you know, once we stamp out extreme poverty, we can become more ambitious, I suppose. But I don't think that we'll ever completely stamp out poverty. I have a question myself. Sure. And that is uh, that public citizen uh, dwelt on the uh, kind of trade relations uh, developed countries have with uh, underdeveloped countries. Uh, and uh, the kind of rules of, uh, uh, that govern uh, loans uh, from whether they're from the World Bank or the IMF, uh, the, those agreements uh, frequently have uh, conditions that yes. uh, uh, very much handicap uh, development in uh, underdeveloped countries. Uh, what does one say about that? I agree that sometimes the conditions made on these sorts of loans or, um, or grants can be crippling, and especially uh, one of the, uh, the issues that I'm most concerned with is uh, African debt or un uh, underdeveloped countries' debt uh, that's accumulated because of these loans that becomes unpayable and it makes it impossible for the country to, uh, to really get back on its feet. And so uh, I support, I believe that the One Campaign does support uh, debt relief, um, generally debt cancellation for countries that have accumulated an unpayable amount of debt through these kind of loan programs. Um, but often, like you say, the clauses and the provisos and whatnot might be a bit self-serving that were put in place, and I, you know, we certainly wouldn't support, support that. You might want to put um, you know, clauses and conditions that ensure good governance would be one of the things, one of the exceptions, where I think it makes sense to include some conditions for you know, loans and for grants. Uh, to increase transparency of the, or the governments and so forth to try to tackle that issue. But um, it's very unfortunate when, you know, when pr provisions are put in place that are self-serving to the donor country uh, rather than to the recipient country. Um, Charles. Yeah, on Kyle, Wednesday was United Nations Day, and the UN's been very much involved in that malaria tent program, and eradication of polio and they want to see that every child on earth gets at least a cup of food per day but then again I put out this happy UN day and then I got all kinds of hate mail <laughs> Wait, you got hate mail from the happy UN day from all the all places wow. uh, like get lost and other that's kind of a mild one oh, fair enough do you think a lot of people in don't have the proper orientation towards the international community uh, do you run into this at all isolation is kind of yeah, I do think that there is a strand of isolationism, um, and that probably has been increased due to you know the recent financial problems, and also maybe a little bit of um, shall you say um, be, just being tired of, of wars and foreign interventions in Iraq, Afghanistan, etc. Regardless of what you think about those uh, interventions, I think that it has kind of led to maybe a little bit of um, you know isolation, think isolationism type thinking. Um, I guess I would say from a, from maybe from a moral or a philosophical standpoint, um, I, it is disconcerting to me when I see um, almost kind of a tribalism inherent in this idea that, well, we should take care of ourselves first and so forth, because uh, to me, the, the thing that binds us all together is our common human nature. And so, although I can understand that we have particular obligations to our family, to our friends, to those that are closer to us, I would also think that we want to have a common bond as human beings, and so it is disturbing to me when people have a focus only on improving, say, their family or their own country, um, because we're talking about our fellow human beings who are, who are suffering. So 
if there's something that can be done without incurring significant cost to ourselves, I, I do think we have a moral imperative to do something. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Very well. Yes, Margaret? Um, could you point one instance where you felt UNO was effective in its efforts? Um, because a lot of the stuff was really vague, and so you said you were focusing on foreign aid. But can you point to one thing that you've done that you could show that you did, that you can show that the organization did and that affected things on a national or international level? Yeah, absolutely. Very good question. And uh, I, I should I should mention that obviously uh, cause and effect can be notoriously difficult to determine. And as we talked about before, one partners with a number of organizations. So I would never want to claim that any particular legislation that was enacted or, or particular improvement was made was solely caused by you know, one's efforts or by my individual efforts. It's obviously uh, very difficult to narrow down to the exact cause. One area that I would point to recently that occurred was uh, probably many people are familiar with the uh, sequestration uh, issue where the budget was being cut across the board. And uh, we campaigned pretty vigorously against uh, foreign aid programs being cut as a result of sequestration and against uh, sequestration in general. Um, unfortunately, we, you know, we wish that the government was more responsible in creating the budget. But uh, the Global Fund actually, and I think largely through uh, advocacy efforts by one and other organizations, was actually exempted from the sequestration and saved, uh, you know, uh, a major amount of money was saved because of that. So. That, that's a recent example, I would say, of where advocacy has made a big impact. I would say that, and one of the reasons I would also mention this is because um, I think that foreign, cutting foreign aid is kind of almost a politically easy thing to do in most cases, unless there's pressure from organizations like one, because, uh, because of the increasing isolationist tendencies we've talked about, uh, because you can make it sound like, oh, we're just going to cut, um, you know, because of the perception people have that foreign aid is, say, 25% of the budget, uh, it's assumed like politicians can sort of get away with th thinking that they could solve budgetary problems by cutting foreign aid programs. So I think it's like a politically easy thing to do. Um, the fact that we're able to even maintain political uh, funding levels for foreign aid, despite the you know economic economically trying times, I think is a good indication of uh, the importance and the effectiveness of advocacy. But I would point to the Global Fund as the most recent example where there was a significant policy benefit from the efforts of advocacy. Well, are we at the end of our question Let's period? go to rebuttals. Uh, if so, I have another question. Okay. And that is, uh, the arms race seems to continue ad nauseum, uh, even though uh, we don't have the uh, division of world powers uh, we had the before the uh, demise of the Soviet Union. Uh, we apparently, uh, there is some competition uh, in armaments, and, uh, which are very expensive, it's more and more expensive as uh, technology develops uh, faster, um, for uh, uh, undetectable and uh, uh, more lethal uh, weapons um, and weapon systems. Um, they're very expensive and uh, uh, underdeveloped countries uh, seek uh, uh, both to be protected against uh, their own people and uh, Aren't you their neighbors. Uh, foreign power. So that's the, the major way that uh, foreign powers uh, try to influence uh, underdeveloped countries and uh, uh, extend their their uh, uh, trade relations, whatever. Yes. Uh, what is one's response to oh, that here. problem? I think they got them. Uh, one does not. Just to clarify, when you talk about the arms race, are you referring to, in general, the military-industrial complex or nuclear armament? Uh, well, uh, if you want to be specific about nuclear armaments, uh, that, uh, uh, that's an interesting field. Fair enough. Yeah, I just want to make sure I understood the, the question. So. Um, the one campaign still does not take very much of a, of a strong stance on, on these questions because of 
uh, our desire to focus on the foreign aid issue and to not to focus on, on those particular issues of, of intervention and, and arms race and so forth. Uh, my particular perspective on this would be that the United Nations uh, needs to play a large role in ensuring security uh, for nations that are suffering from uh, civil wars and from other, um, you know, bad actors out there. That's your position or what? That's my position. What the One Campaign, uh, like I mentioned, as far as I understand, does not take a strong stance on military intervention issues. For example, in the Syria issue, we did not take a stance on whether um, bomb bombing should be uh, used in the case of Syria. Um, but my personal stance would be that the United Nations should take a larger role in uh, ensuring security for countries uh, that face these kind of issues. Just as a, as a final question for our web audience, uh, can you give us a little bit about your personal background and what got you involved in one on a personal level, and two, tell us how people can volunteer and get a hold of you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I first got involved with one campaign about five years ago, and at the time I was only involved on the online petitions and so forth. I, I don't remember the first time I was engaged with the one campaign. Um, my personal background is I've uh, got a degree in business and finance, and I own a small web design company. So as I mentioned at the, at the start, um, this is purely a volunteer position, and I don't have any particular background in international development um, or in, or in uh, you know, doing uh, you know, advocacy type, type uh, things. But I have become more involved with one campaign because of my personal passion for the issue of the suffering of the poor. I would say that my motivations are, are largely driven by uh, my convictions of my Christian faith that have been very formative for me since I was a, a young person. And uh, so that's in, enticed me to get involved, not only in the one campaign, but also in other organizations that are working to end extreme poverty, such as World Vision and others. Um, but yes, I, I was first involved with one campaign about five years ago um, on the email list and so forth. And then approximately uh, one and a half years ago, I was contacted by a representative at the one campaign asking if I would like to take a larger role um, because they noticed the high level of activity that I had uh, for the campaign. Uh, that's when I was asked to be a congressional district leader, and I volunteered to do so, and uh, and I've been doing that uh, since then for about a year and a half. Uh, let's see, um, uh, Margaret. Um, you said that you were involved with World Vision. Yes. And could you talk about that a little bit? I see that the people that were involved in the anti-gay stuff in Africa, or am I got that? I don't believe so. Okay. But that's a Christian organization that does like missionary work in places? No, World Vision doesn't do uh, missionary work, uh, but they they are a, cr a Christian organization, but they are purely development from the studies that I've looked at. Uh, but you were involved in it. Yeah, I, well, like for example, I ran the Chicago Marathon for Team World Vision and raised funds for the organization. Um, but I'm not like, I don't, I'm not a volunteer leader with World Vision. I was just saying that I'm personally passionate about these kind of issues. That's why I'm involved in like you know giving basis and so forth. And I stay on top of the news with other organizations like World Vision. So I guess I was just trying to say that my focus isn't only on the one campaign, but it's just an issue that I'm particularly passionate about. Yes, but, Charles. Yeah, Kyle. You said you're involved in web design. What do you think about the web page I designed for the College of Counselors? <laughs> <laughs> Get on, man. Do you want me to answer? No, no. I'm happy to. No, no, no. <laughs> we'll, we'll have a conversation off camera if, if that works. No. <laughs> Cubs or Sox fan? Uh, well, actually, I am from uh, Michigan until Ooh. I moved to Chicago about a year and a half ago. Uh, so I am actually a Tigers fan. So, uh, that probably gets me booed off the stage, so I apologize. Uh, you had, I'm sorry, to answer you, had an additional question about where people can learn more yes. about uh, the One Campaign. And I would just encourage them to uh, go to the website, um, uh, one.org. And uh, my personal information, I'm more than happy to answer questions. I have some, some One cards here with me that I was going to hand out if anyone wanted to follow up with me. I'm more than happy to get in contact with people about uh, about the one campaign. Um, I can be re my name is Kyle Deming. I can be reached at Kyle K Y L E Deming D E M I N G at gmail.com. And uh, I'm more than happy, like I mentioned, to get in a dialogue with people that might be passionate about these issues. Very good. All right. Ted Rock. Thanks again. I appreciate it.
One quick question. Uh, how much uh, do Bill and Melinda Gates control or own uh, one? What is the relationship? Well, there was actually, I think, 14 founding partners of one. Uh, there was a number of them. Oxfam, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, I do know that they have given us a substantial amount of the funding because since we don't actually take donations from uh, from volunteers, most funding, as far as I understand, does come from Melinda and, and uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Is that, is that correct? Uh, that is correct, and I'm, I apologize, I don't have the exact numbers, uh, but um, as far as I know, the majority of the funding for our organization does come from the Gates Foundation, and then we have other donors as well. Okay, now comes the uh, rebuttal period in which uh, you can enlighten the rest of us or uh, raise the questions that others have not uh, sufficiently raised or answered. Okay, uh, how many have remarks to make? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, well, let's allocate up to six minutes for uh, up to six minutes. You don't have to occupy the the uh, microphone for six minutes, but uh, you can go that far. You're okay, uh, sir. You're all good, honey. After which, uh, you will hear again from our speaker. Sounds good. All right. All right. Beginning with Joe Mayer. All right. Why don't we move your stuff around? Yeah, of course. All right. Okay. So it doesn't get knocked around here. Technical difficulty. Okay. Well, all right. Give him a minute. All right, let's take a speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, a few trivia remarks first. Um, it has been written that uh, Jesus ordered the, the servants at a wedding party to fill the empty wine jugs with water. But by that time, most of the attendees were so drunk, they didn't know the difference between wine and water. Um, now, another uh, trivia point it was in the New York Times today. Uh, it turns out that there's the beginning of a very severe epidemic of polio in Pakistan, one of our allies. Um, it's attributable to the prevalence of the religious idea against uh, vaccination for one thing, and the fear that's been engendered by those religious uh, uh, positions. Um, the three syllogisms that were brought by one by our speaker, uh, basically revolve about a moral uh, argument, an economic argument, and a security argument. And that they, all three of those converge into something called trade, international trade, between other countries and the United States. Now, it was brought out by Margaret that most of those items that we sell, sell for money to the foreign countries, our uh, farm products, which we overproduce, and armaments. So that's not a great idea. Uh, the, the countries that uh, we give food aid to to eliminate the extreme poverty uh, respond by buying our uh, uh, arms and our excess surplus uh, farm products. Uh, now there's another problem. There's another problem. Don't be sorry, Frank. Just shut up. I didn't say I was sorry. She said. She always said the same thing. I'm sorry, and she repeat the same shit every week. So do you. Oh, anyway, um, I have bad news for the elite. Um, it turns out that there, there's a, a strong competition. Some of the working class has managed to raise itself up 
through university education and hard work uh, to become part of the elite. But there are so many of these people in that category now, and there are so few jobs, so few top jobs, corporate top jobs, that there's a severe competition and that those people are becoming restless. They realize that they, they deserve top jobs and they're not getting them because they aren't there. There's severe competition. And uh, it, it brings them to the same position in life that uh, employees or workers uh, experience. Uh, stagnant wages, the wages of employees at any level has been stagnant since the 1970s in constant dollars. So we have a real problem there. If, I don't want to follow the elite into a revolution. I don't think that would benefit me or anyone else. Hello. Um, we, we always have this uh, kind of off, off, off the of the cuff situations and uh, uh, we should be more coherent among us to point out to the people who are uh, trespassing the boundaries of common uh, decency to, to remind them that they are doing it. And uh, especially I felt very bad that uh, the previous speaker comments were very important and uh, the man who should have been hearing he couldn't because not, not your fault entirely because people here are so uh, out of the uh, common sense that they keep insisting in doing this talking uh, of, uh, out of time and out of uh, context and so on and so forth. Uh, what, I, what I really have to say that I am very very discouraged with the way that the world is going and especially um, our, uh, you said to put the feet to the fire of our politicians and you don't know that they wear asbestos shoes because they, <laughs> they don't fucking listen to anything. They are really, 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 really out of it, out of uh, caring for what happened to us or what can happen to anybody else. Uh, the way that you mentioned about, uh, I, I appreciate the speaker very much, it's very coherent, very, very knowledgeable and everything and it's wonderful to see young people to be so uh, aware of what's going on and so concerned and working on it. Uh, that is one of the few things that I see, uh, see as positive in this world. But um, that uh, a corporation going to uh, exploit the minerals or something is really a brutal thing, exploitation, leaving the environment as a, as a mess. Uh, in Brazil, the mercury is still poisoning people after a couple hundred years of the British uh, getting gold out of there. Um, in Africa, with the extraction of, uh, or in Australia, with the extraction of uh, uh, uranium, is uh, the, 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 the land is land uh, totally uninhabitable with radiation waste all over the place. Here in the United States, by extracting the a gas by fracking we are leaving uh, a devastation with radiation all over the place uh, our uh, uh, asbestos wearing shoes uh, uh, idiots uh, are allowing passing laws to allow the dumping of the radioactive waters that they are used for the fracking process to be done in municipal dumps uh, which in turn are not prepared for that uh, level of radiation, so they are leaking into the river and to the aquifers. We are fucking up ourselves, the environment, and everybody else. This industrial uh, illusion that we have by having available energy by the mean of fossil fuels is coming to an end. It's coming to an end, it's crashing, because we are not willing to confront the reality of how brutal we have been and how brutal we are. Um, I don't see that anybody is willing to give up their, uh, you know, their privileged positions, whether it's us here in the United States or anywhere else where they want to raise the standard of living uh, in spite of all the, 
the consequences. Uh, and one last point that is really, really, really sad. Um, in, this, in Argentina, the Pampas of Argentina, the topsoil started by 18 feet of topsoil. Topsoil is something very, very special, if you understand what involves. But it's things that accumulate during thousands of years. It takes about a thousand years to accumulate one inch of topsoil where plants could grow. Um, in Argentina, because of China and India buying the soybeans, they are converting the topsoil in sand. What happened here many years ago is happening there at great pace. We are destroying something that it was supposed to be, a survival arc for the whole world, and we are dumping it to the sea. It is very, very, very sad. So My personal view is that unlike our previous rebutter, I see hope. Yeah, I see change. I see real hope in the world. And that yeah. tonight was given by a lot of the statistics that the one campaign had brought about. And I really think that uh, when you're talking about environmental degradation, you're talking about global warming, you're talking about all these other things, we can solve these problems. I honestly think that the greatest poverty reducing program in the world is a good job at a small company that's trading with other small companies and economic activity growing. Once a person has a job or runs a business, they tend to bring themselves out of poverty, trade increases, and it's done by a against the backdrop of property rights, of good, clean governance, much like what the Peruvian Foundation, the Institute of Liberty and Democracy is doing today, ran by a man by the name of Fernando de Soto out of a book called The Mystery of Capital. It's not just a bunch of libertarian stuff, but at the same time, as much as I advocate capitalism and economic development, there is a downside to it. We have seen rising inequality. We've seen the rise, and again, of uh, multinational corporations, and they change constantly. But we did this 100 years ago through the Sherman Antitrust Act, through some regulation of industry and good work practices, and finally, the development of a good labor union movement that gave workers a, a say in what they had to do with good working conditions. I don't say this lightly because I myself like business. I like trade. I think that that's really what will be the biggest reliever of poverty. And I think we're seeing it today with a lot of the trends of globalization, with the trends of communication technology. We're finally seeing the development of Africa and what happened to us 150 years ago is finally beginning to happen to them and the rest of the world. Child labor. Charlie, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. we came through it. You know, as much as you might decry child labor, Therefore, people like you have to get involved, point it out, and put a stop to it. That's why you have good governance. I'll take a good case in point, if you don't believe me. Take a look at the country of Singapore, about maybe in the, right after World War II. It was famished, it was in poverty, uh, maybe not so much that, but it was not developed as it should be. And what their government did was the first thing they did was land reform. They started, you know, going on cheap products and trading. And now, in less than a generation, they've been able to reach some of the top tiers of the economic ladder and trade and other things. And it was a direct result of globalization that did this. Now, I'm not going to say that uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates goals aren't bad. 
because they're really good and we really need a lot of good entrepreneurial spirit in these foreign aid organizations. I'm not advocating a type of capitalism like we see in the United States, which is uh, right now what our good old, I'm sorry, uh, it's called corporatism, it's called, what we have here is called kleptocracy, not true capitalism. True capitalism lets businesses fail. It lets businesses prosper. And if you have trade, people are talking to each other. And yes, I've spoken about this in the past. I still think it's going to require energy and it's going to be some form of nuclear power that powers the world into the future because it's the only way that I think we're going to be able to save our environment. Enough said. Thank you very much, speakers, for coming tonight. Yeah, well, that's Tim Boyd who just spoke there. Yeah, and I'm right. Uh, I'm right. Very really far right. What's your... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Look at our jeans on. We got some articulate young men here. Well educated. Even the Sox fan, I'm a Cubs fan, but I respect, <laughs> I respect <laughs> Cubs fan. I like your speech, your temporary speech up here. <coughs> but, uh, Tim Barger here reminds me of a wannabe. And what I mean about that, and it's not a push attack, because oh, I'm, this is Teddy. You know. He's talked like Sean Kennedy. He talked like <laughs> Russ Lindbaugh. So to me, he must have be been practicing and auditioning to take their place. Because he sounds <laughs> like they sound. The truth, history, facts, doesn't mean nothing to them. They don't remember. They can't. Yesterday it was a different story. Double talk is part of their repertoire. And the script. Uh, uh, capitalism, <laughs> democracy, all bunch of words. Those are scripts. Somebody else wrote them down. You didn't create them. Now, the part that saddened me is these handsome young men, mm -hmm. and I'm not gay, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they are kind of scary. But in a way, they affirm what I know already, that we will never be what we claim that we want to be and should be on paper because, guess what? Somebody got them when they were little, and they are part of the problem, not attacking them because they done accomplished something and they're serious about their mission, I hope. And I believe they are because the way they were, were, were passionate about the talking. However, however, if you point out a problem like hunger and poverty and whatever, inequality, it's man-made. And whatever is man-made can be solved by man. We don't need young people that have been conditioned to believe the old story. That we got to do this, we got to do that. Now, why I can say this very loudly is that he said, go to your conference, go to your center, and do this and do that and do that. We don't have no goddamn centers in Congress. They've been bought. The lobbyists got me beat, got you beat, and everybody else beat. He, the senator, the representative, don't work for us. He work for the lobbyists and the big boys, the folks that run the world. That's who he work for. And I want to, to, to quote my man over here, Lyndon Anderson. He said, because uh, I didn't read it, he said that uh, uh, the, the guy with, from Princeton, uh, Einstein said, if you keep doing the same thing over, then you'll get the same results. And that's insanity. Now, uh, I'm a little familiar with Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer said similar thing that you're doing it over and over again, and, and you'll never be shit because of it. Buddha went out and lived in the woods <laughs> for the same reason. Because he looked around, and he was, well, he was oppressed. And he said, man, I can't take this shit, because y'all doing it over and over again. Well, I got news for you. It's simple. And that's why, that's why 
I'm up here because I used you, lady, uh, like the last couple weeks I didn't get up here because I'm going to say the same thing I'm going to say all the time. You, you, you got to know, you got to know the problem in order to work on the solution. And if you ignore the problem, then you ain't going to solve it. And if you ain't got the power in the position, then you just waving for nothing. For instance, to give you a quick example of what I'm trying to say here, if you playing with both Joan at the uh, Friday night uh, or poker game, and he got my cards, you ain't going to win. Mm -hmm. But you don't know he got my cards, so you're there every Friday. And guess what? Y'all going to talk together, the losers. And yeah, they're going to say, oh, man, oh, oh, man. So, oh, we got to learn how to play this game. That's what it said. And they go over to some expert and teach them how to try to learn how to play poker. Well, I got goddamn news for you. I don't care who teach you, you ain't going to beat the mob car. Unless you're going to change what I see and what the system is and what it's been ever since man been around. You ain't got nothing coming. The government's supposed to be, you familiar with Thomas Hart? Hart? With his uh, uh, contract. Oh, yeah. Okay. Who, what he was talking about? He was talking about a governor. Uh, government that men gonna be fighting one another and that what they call it uh, the jungle you the, the, the physics of the jungle or something he called I can't think of it. I'm old I can't remember everything but he was saying that man is against man the law of the jungle law of the jungle that's what it was the law, law of the jungle and what we need is outside here and he was talking about the government and uh, Locke was one of his followed him and, and, and was similar things. And there was other like Jacques Rousseau and so forth. Guess what? Even our founding fathers put up a picture to us that our government gonna solve our problem. Now government, if it was Hobbes, if it was for Hobbes and what the founding fathers said, guess what? They would protect us from the abuse of all right the people yeah, out there that is responsible for poverty, ignorance, and everything else that is negative in the world, our governments, and not, not just our government, but each government all over the world, if they was hobbyists, <coughs> they would take care of them. But they don't. And they never did at the beginning of the time. So don't, I hate to see y'all waste your time, and, but that's good. Because like Descartes said, it take me 40 years, forget about all that shit they talk about. St. Paul said, I was a child, I was a child, I thought I was a child, but I ain't no child no more, so fuck y'all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> just in time to get a highlight of the <laughs> you know, this is uh, well, this is a real good presentation tonight. Um, I actually came specifically because uh, because That's it was about... There, what, what do you mean, what's not in? in what, this middle. thing? In the middle. Okay, uh, well, I don't want to mess around with this thing. I just get on with my speech. First of all, um, first of all, I and I, um, I, you know, I have a lot of, um, I, I have a lot of respect for what one is doing. I knew about the organization before I came here, and um, uh, there is, um, there's one area where I would, um, would disagree with with your with your speech a little bit. You. Uh, you, you, Charlie here brought up uh, talking about United Nations Day and getting a lot of hate mail. I have a pretty good idea where that hate mail came from, but not the specific people, what kind of people it was. Uh, you attributed that to uh, kind of a war weariness, you know, hostility to the UN, to the people getting tired of the US being in so many wars. I don't think that was it at all. Uh, there's you know, there, there's a there's a political movement in this country, which is generally known as the conservative movement, and, and has, uh, has traditionally opposed international organizations like the UN. Uh, back in, in, when Woodrow Wilson was president, he wanted the United States to join the League of Nations, and at that time, uh, conservative Republicans actually had a majority in both houses of Congress, and and strongly opposed U.S. membership in the League of Nations, uh, and. More recently, you know, in the post-World War II era, you had, for example, the John Birch Society claiming all kinds of uh, wild conspiracy theories that, that involved the UN. Um, and and uh, during the Reagan era, I remember it was real common to hear conservatives saying that the United States should withdraw from the United Nations. In the Bush era, you know, when George W. Bush was president, uh, Bush's approach was not so much to to 
advocate withdrawing from the UN is to just, just ignore them. And, and that's kind of what he did when he went to war in Iraq. At that time, uh, 10 years ago, and my, I have a pretty good memory. I, I can actually remember what happened 10 years ago, believe it or not. And, and I remember that at that time, the people who were, who were raging against the UN were enthusiastically in favor of us going to war with Iraq and, and kicking Saddam Hussein's ass. So, so I don't think it's really war weariness as just a general hostility to the UN among people who may oppose, be in favor of war some of the time and against war at other times, but are just generally always against the UN. Uh, now, Joe, uh, Joe Meyer said, uh, described Pakistan as an ally. I would, uh, they, I would say they were an ally at one time in the past, but I would not describe Pakistan as an ally of the US now. Um, uh, for example, uh, right now, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but the United States is, is, uh, has been launching airstrikes uh, against Pakistan, uh, mainly with drone aircraft, unmanned aircraft, uh, in, which, uh, in which large numbers of people are killed, actually several thousand so far, uh, almost all of them civilians. Uh, that is not what you normally do to an ally. I can't imagine the U.S. doing that, for example, to England. Uh, for their part, the Pac uh, nearly all of the Pakistanis strongly oppose the U.S. involvement in their country. Uh, not only uh, Islamic fundamentalists like uh, like the Taliban, but even uh, even people who believe in in democracy and human rights, uh, ideals that the United States that Americans once were thought to believe in, even they oppose the U.S. presence. Uh, now, now Tim. Tim suggested here that the way out of poverty is to get a job. Uh, I wish that were true. I wish it was that simple. Um, the vast majority of people who live in poverty work extremely hard, actually harder than the people that aren't poor, for the most part, and yet they remain poor. Working harder doesn't make them less poor. Uh, because, and this is, not only, this is not only true for people in Africa, who, where they're most, of the, most of the poor are subsistence farmers, um, but it is also true for poor people here in the United States. Most of them, most of them work, and um, because there's a kind of a po because po there's a kind of a poverty trap. If you have a low-paying job, you're lucky if you can even make ends meet, right. and therefore you never quite save up enough money to get ahead. And if you were born to parents who also were poor, you get an inferior education, and that ensures. Because money buys everything in this country, including good schools. And, and if you get an inferior education, then, or if you get no education, that guarantees that you are not going to do very well in, in terms of getting a well-paying job, and therefore you also will be poor. And if you have kids, they also will be poor, and so on and so forth. So self poverty is self-perpetuating. Most poor people are poor because they always have been. Uh, now, uh, now, on the subject of Singapore, there's absolutely no comparison with a country like Chad or, the or Nigeria or the Central African Republic, because Singapore is, or even with Singapore's neighbor in Malaysia, because Singapore is a city state. It's just one city. It's like Hong Kong. You know, I mean, if you were to take, let's say, Bangkok, the capital of Thailand, and carve it off, it, you know, it'd be kind of like Singapore, especially if you could keep all the people from the country from moving into the city. The fact that they're a city-state means that they don't get any people from the, from the rural areas moving in. They can, they can close the border, uh, and, uh, which they've done. So, um, so it, there really is no comparison with Singapore. Uh, I mean, there's really no comparing Singapore with other, with other, um, with other so-called third world countries. Uh, now, on the subject of true capitalism, I don't believe that true capitalism ever has existed. I'm not even sure what it means. I, for myself, I see a significant difference between a, you know, between a subsistence farmer who sells his surplus in in, in a market in order to feed his family, and um, and and uh, let's say Halliburton uh, uh, making a profit from government contracts. I think there's a significant, I, I don't see those two things as being the same thing. But that's just my opinion. Hi, uh, my name is Andy Anderson, and my brother and I run a small organization called the Northwest Information Service. 
uh, Palatine, and we collect and translate books on blacked out subjects, things the reporters can get fired for writing about in America. Uh, I brought, this is the latest copy for all of you that haven't seen it, it's called Censored 2014. This is the 37th year that Project Censored out of Sonoma State has been publishing a book. The journalism school, it's like the Mayo Clinic of investigative journalism. They publish a book that has the top 25 blacked out stories that would change America overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out. The 2011 edition of this book was blacked out by the left-wing press, Democracy Now! and everything else, because it talked about the massive forensic evidence on 9-11, the myth of 9-11 that's been published all over the world. That's one of the things that Americans are living with, but I'm not here to talk about 9-11 tonight. Uh, we'll, we'll give you an update December 14th, for those of you that are interested. I'm going to give a summary of the top 10 stories out of this book and a, a quick summary of the top perennial 10 that are still radioactive in America. Now, one of the things you talked about tonight touches on a subject that is absolutely radioactive in America. If you try to talk about it, radio, TV, uh, any, any uh, major media, if you start talking about what scientists are doing publishing the reality on a couple of subjects, the station manager will dive for the red button and cut the picture off. They go to commercial because they got a 30 second time delay so that what you were talking about never gets out to see the light of day and then they just walk over and fire the reporter or the person that's uh, trying to talk about it. I'll make a couple, a few quick observations here. Um, I agree with Gene totally uh, and Frank too. Frank is depressed about uh, the situation in America. Well. Gene's absolutely right, and I published an article a couple of years ago, five years ago, saying language matters. We can't keep talking about our politicians and referring to them as politicians. They're not. They're intellectual prostitutes. They're highly paid intellectual prostitutes. That's why they don't give a shit about what we people think, because they're owned and operated by billionaire corporate predators. We have predators, billionaire predators running this country right now. And uh, they control and own the media, as described in books like this one and hundreds of others every year, by journalists uh, publishing stuff that never sees the light of day. I work with what's called the Galileo Curve. Galileo was first. He published the truth. He wasn't first, but he was the first one to actually uh, publish it and get some notoriety before they threatened to burn him at the stake. So he had to recant, but people came along behind him with telescopes and said, hey, he was right. Knowledge moves forward in the direction of truth. Once something is recorded as absolutely true, scientifically solid, it comes up out of the scientific community and into the general public. In 1970 in this country, the public said enough and rose up in mass all over the country and put an end to the Vietnam War. 30 years ago in this country, you could get into a fist fight if you asked somebody to put out a cigarette in a restaurant next to you. The public said, enough is enough. We've accepted smoke-free buildings. Martin Luther King said, nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere stupidity and conscientious ignorance. <laughs> you, you have sincere, conscientious people out there promoting a viewpoint that's completely 180 degrees out of phase from the reality that exists in other places. Uh, in America, the media have locked us into believing mythology on certain subjects. One classic example is asbestos. In 1918, they knew asbestos was a killer. By 1929, the companies had developed a strategy for keeping the medical records away from their workers, and when anybody sued for damages or whatever, they'd seal the files, settle out of court, and then when a new case came along, they'd say, well, we have no evidence that this is a problem. They covered it up for 50 years when the knowledge of the death toll from asbestos was very solid. It takes time going through uh, as knowledge moves up the Galileo curve out in the general public after it becomes absolutely solid and well known. How much time do I have left, Tim? A couple about minutes? A, about a minute. Okay. Uh, 19 years ago, as, again, this is this is censored 2014. The censored, censored 1995 edition of this book. This number 16 story that they researched and reported was 
that the HIV testing clinics around this country and all over the world were telling people they were positive when they weren't. That is 99% of all people that got an HIV positive test result were told that they were HIV positive when they had no HIV in their blood at all. That was 19 years ago. Today, we know that what was called false positives back then are all false positives because the HIV tests come with an insert in the package that says this test doesn't test for or react to the HIV virus. You can't sue them for telling you're positive when you get a positive result on the HIV test. For some 20 years now, thousands of doctors have been reporting that malaria and tuberculosis are two of the classic things that react to the bogus HIV tests. The HIV test reacts to all kinds of blood in your blood when you're sick from over 108 different kinds of illnesses. And uh, nobody pointed it out because it's been blacked out. You can look it up. The World Health Organization, who, World Health Organization, five years ago, five and a half years ago in June, they put out a report saying there is no heterosexual AIDS epidemic. It's over. The only place you have to worry about catching AIDS is in Africa. They're still promoting the idea that AIDS is infectious in Africa when virtually everybody in Africa that's ever been exposed to malaria, tuberculosis, and a bunch of bacterial infections, they will show up positive on the HIV test. But they're not even using the HIV test for telling these people they're positive. They're just saying you got AIDS because you're sick, and Africa has become the dumping ground for the fatally toxic HIV medicines that murdered 300,000 Americans in this country. There's a new video out that talks about that poor boy from Indiana, Ryan White, the hemophiliac. It says the neat thing you need to know about Ryan White was that we were told he was contaminated from uh, contaminated blood and he died of AIDS. Well, the new video says Ryan White didn't have AIDS and he didn't die of AIDS. He was murdered. He was murdered by a cheerleading AIDS doctor that was paid $10,000 per patient to prescribe the fatal AZT. They knew they were poisoning their patients. And when you say, we don't have any doctors that would do that, I ask you to look up something called the Tuskegee experiment. For those of you that don't know about the Tuskegee experiment, you think that doctors wouldn't do something if you give them enough money. Well, there it is. The cure for the AIDS epidemic worldwide, scientists have been saying for 20 years, just come out and tell people. There is no infectious AIDS epidemic. They've been taking people from a bunch of different categories of illnesses and lumping it under this big heading called AIDS. And that's why the United States has never mounted any kind of program to stop the infectious spread of AIDS because they knew from day one that it was not an infectious syndrome. It's a definition of different illnesses. So. Uh, anybody wants any information on that, we'll have Xerox copies of that and some of the other top 10 blacked out subjects December 14th here when I give the talk on censored news. Thank you. Well. True capitalism is when it works well. And when it doesn't, that it's something else. But there never was true capitalism that works well. It always has the problem of creating a slave class, a servant class, that does not own, and a owning class, the capitalist class, that uh, feels its right, its entitlement uh, to do good and to distribute uh, and uh, to invest and uh, to control and to keep the rest of us in line. Well, I'm a convinced socialist, but I'm also a convinced Christian, and that's why I am a socialist, because I am a convinced Christian, as our speaker is. Uh, and, you know, churches, I mean, 
I, I'm not sure whether it was Gandhi or, or someone else who said, when asked uh, uh, about uh, um, Western Christianity, uh, uh, he said that uh, he thought it would Might work. Be a good idea. It was a very good idea, and uh, he hoped they they would apply it. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, but churches are like labor unions or any other organization in our well, society. Labor union is not like a church. <laughs> yes, it, no, it is. is. Uh, they vote. In, in churches, church. uh, congreg congregational churches and Presbyterian <laughs> churches, uh, and uh, even Methodist churches, uh, and sometimes Episcopal churches and Lutheran churches and so on, they vote. Of course, there are different groups in Methodist churches. Uh, there are the clergy groups that vote, and there are the Presbyterian elders who vote, and so on. But they are all elected. And there is some democracy in churches, at least in most countries, even particularly in the United States, because we did go through a reformation of the church. Uh, but that doesn't make them non-bourgeois. Now, I am impressed with Karl Marx, who, if you didn't know it, invested a good deal of his time and his, uh, his love to a bourgeois reformist organization called the Neue Rheinische Zeitung, uh, which uh, was the newspaper of the sometimes somewhat revolutionary bourgeoisie of uh, Western Germany, uh, Southwestern Germany. And uh, unfortunately, their revolution somewhat fizzled, uh, but Bismarck uh, put it a good deal of the uh, what they wanted into practice uh, as part of the uh, uh, top-down reformations of the Prussian Empire. Uh, well, anyway, uh, yeah, he, so, uh, one uh, is, I would say, a bourgeois reformist organization, and I think that uh, you, you probably could do worse than to uh, join and uh, work through it, uh, because it uh, advocates for some uh, good development policies. Now, unfortunately, I don't think it goes into a significant detail about what good uh, development policies are and what they are not. Uh, I, I doubt that they get too specific uh, because it's a very controversial matter. And, uh, but that's a matter for your investigation. Thank you. I'll be there in the morning. <laughs> I wish you lots of success. Lots of people have been trying there for thousands of years and you are in line. The, my religion, uh, don't say a lot, it says uh, work is worship. Knowledge will set you free, and truth will prevail. So those are the altruistic things. The Bill Gates has, has, a, has lots of money, 
He spent lots of money and uh, he had a mixed success. He has, he has found it more challenging Africa than he would have thought when he started. But uh, it perseveres and works hard and continues and that is admirable quality. The biggest population of world world is facing on every single country, including USA, is that we are living too long <coughs> and we are making too many babies. And in making too many babies, the more poor you are, you make more babies across the world and in America, and more rich you are, make less babies. So wealth accumulates and poverty accumulates. People are living too long, non-productive people are being supported by middle-aged people and uh, it's becoming great burden in USA and in all the countries, either in Africa or India or China or Japan or USA or Western Europe. These problems are uh, very generic and has to be solved unless longevity beyond 70 has proven a problematic because we cannot provide work to everybody and uh, if over 70 population becomes too much, it's going to cross and it is crossing all the economies and all the people. The biggest problem of poverty in China, India, Bangladesh, at least I know, is poor people do not have a contraception yet and that is creating lots of poverty. Women are spoiling their health by repeated pregnancy and often child dying and uh, it's not working out. China's effort has failed to control population and that is very sad news. The, we do not have, as technology develops, it's good. Technology is two-way sword. It, it has a lots of promise, can do lots of things. At the same time, it requires less people to do more things. So where are you going to provide the job? In Africa, what happened to India is happening in Africa. With cholera, malaria, polio, it's easier to cure them. But then population explodes. And population explodes, we do not have a way of means to provide them jobs, provide them food, provide them quality of life. We can make them live, but we cannot give them quality of life. In America, the same thing happening with technology that is crushing us. We cannot provide everybody decent job. That is a false promise. There is no way everybody have a decent paying jobs in America. Sure, because uh, just, just, it's, uh, just dumb numbers doesn't gel. Yeah. It's, 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 it's like that line telling you that, that we found a 100 light, year, 100 light years away a planet which is, has gold and everything, everything we want and we are going to go there. We are not going to go there. Okay, it's a reality because it has to, it has to make. If everybody gets a good job, where are you going to get from? Where, the, where all the production is going to go from? China, China prospered over the last 30 years when they realized they can export production to Western Europe and United States. And they did it. And what other thing they did is in doing that, they uplifted 400, 500 million people from poverty to middle class. So they got a little better standard of living. India did not do that. So India suffered. But that was the window of opportunity. Africa do not have that window of opportunity. They do not have that kind of resources. They, they do not have that kind of education. They do not have that kind of background. Okay, so the Africa's population has exploded tremendously over the last 50 years. And we have a serious problem. Unless, unless we create a restriction on population, we educate more, and technology we, we use sparingly will have problem. Thank you.
Yeah, well, it's good that I got here just in time to hear Gene uh, fill us in a little bit in broad outline about Hobbes and the Founding Fathers and all that, and I'm going to pick up on that. And But before I get into the, some of the substance of it, it's just striking that tonight here we've got three retired cops, right, Bruce? Okay. I see, I'm going to speculate that retired cops, the kind of retired cops who come to this place, maybe they saw shit on the inside that others didn't want to see or something like that. All right. And so a guy like Gene could say what he's got, he said, and I'm going to pick up that ball and carry it somewhat further. And point out to you folks, when dudes like Hobbes and the Framers and Tom Paine and, all, and those dudes were writing what they were writing, they had a word, they had a chance to get a word in edgewise. They weren't just taken out and burnt, like Jan Hus was back a couple centuries before. And what changed it was the printing press. What's changing it in these past 50 years is A, the rise of the boob tube, and B, the cleaning out of the Walter Cronkites and the Ed Murrows and dudes like that, who some of whom at least earned their spurs in the print and the print media scene, the newspaper scene, where there were actually standards about something besides what would be telegenic, like the black face of OJ and the white face of Nicole. Alright? Or then when they did the split screen, do you show the black when they announced the verdict, you showed the black audience and the white audience, and the verdict, the black audience was all rah rah rah, and the white audience was all stunned. Okay? This is how it goes with the mainstream with the TV especially. But and there's all sorts of things to account for why they do it that way as opposed to the way dudes like Cronkite and Murrow did it back, you know, that's sort of a separate speech in itself. But it's worth just recalling the words of another dude who's not been around here for a while at the college, Bill Went. It ain't what you expect, it's what you expect. And what's been going on, thanks to the boob tube and the mentality that's taken over in these past 50 years in the boob tube, is that insofar as there's any inspecting at all, it's going through the motions, all right? You know, maybe, and, and, and what it's going to take, if it ever were to change around, change around in this respect, it would change insofar as you had not just one lone wolf out there blowing the whistle, like what Dylan Radigan tried to do, all right? But where you, once a Dylan Radigan opened up his yap, then one after one after one of the punditocracy would get and turn it into an echo chamber type of scene instead of one dude or woman, as the case may be, hanging out to dry, which is what we have whenever somebody like a Dylan Radigan says something worth hearing. That, in the first instance, is, in my, in my judgment, a historic change. It's the most significant change in political culture of, you know, industrial, of modern society since Gutenberg came up with that printing press. All right, and you know, yes, the, there's folks on the web who are trying to turn it around, but in the main, they're spitting in the ocean. Now, having said that, I should inform everybody, some of you already know, that next weekend, there's going to be a conference in town here of a, of a bunch, they call themselves the Bioneers instead of the Pioneers. It's at Roosevelt University, Friday through Sunday, and it's, you know, for the three days, it'll cost you 116 bucks. Plus the meals. But, you know, and it'll, for one day it'll cost you 55 And among the folks are going to be there is the arch-druid of the American Druids, John Michael Greer, who, by my lights, prima facie alone is going to be worth the price of admission. All right? He's one of the leading lights, the, the critics, if you like, of what's going on in American culture uh, and how the industrial society is in the process of more or less committing suicide and he's got a whole bunch of respect in the peak oil etc community he's a can't miss dude just for starters but of course there's going to be other folks there like him now today margaret and i and frank we went to a shebang over at north park village um where they were t teaching us how to take a piece of wood and use coal and burn a hole, sort of, and make a crevice in, in the wood to make a spoon. You take charcoal and, you know, you got to blow on with a little straw and all to get the, 
to keep, get it going. And the trouble is that with the elites in this country just more or less pillaging the place, like they are, in due course, I fear, we're going to have to end up doing more of shit like that. All right? And, you know, and these guys, and they get away with it in the first instance because that thing up there implicitly covers for them. And once the Cronkites and the Murrows croaked, they brought in the bimbos and the smarty pantses like Larry King, among others. You know, just, just a softball. These guys throw softballs in the main. And so the powers that be and their shills just get to coast. So, you know, if, but if you want to get some sort of understanding of what's really going on in all sorts of different respects, go to Roosevelt University next weekend. You've got a few days to sign up online for the 116 for the three days, you know. Um, it's that, that it's in town here is just unbelievably fantastic by my lights. So if you can afford the 116 bucks or some such, I just can't, I just can't recommend it more highly. The Greer, he writes once a week and he gets just, you know, the, the debates that go back and forth on his side among the commenters. You just can't beat it. Um, so, you know, you lucky to say, folks, there's, in a sense, it's almost, that's the trouble. You can watch that thing, and it's in, it's in every restaurant, and it's in every grocery store nowadays, practically, and so on. Or you can go online if you know where to go, and you can actually go to physical places if you know where to go with a little bit of luck or this or that, and actually get some sort of authentic debate and efforts. People are really busting their ass trying to figure out what's really going down. So, I don't know, I don't know how much time I got left, but uh, it's all just, it's a hell of a time to be alive. To see this joint, the, to see the gap between what the masses see on that thing and what you can pick up on if you do happen to have the luck or the this or the that to know where to go, to check up on shit. So. First, I'd like to thank our speakers for a very interesting and provocative presentation. Um, for many years, I've been listening to some of the whiners and groaners and complainers about foreign aid, when all we've ever spent on foreign aid amounts to a drop in the bucket, period, plain and simple. And the sort of people who usually complain about foreign aid are the sort of people whom President Truman's Secretary of State, Dean Atchison, had in mind when he wrote his book, when he wrote his uh, memoir, President of the Creation, My Years at the State Department, and he entitled the chapter that concerned the people who hollered at him because he was letting too many communists work in the State Department, the attack of the primitives begins. And those are the same kind of people who usually have been criticizing foreign aid, the primitives. I think President John Kennedy said it best in his, in his inaugural address. When President Kennedy said, if a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. And I think that's something that the American people ought to remember. And finally, when Robert Kennedy, and I don't remember the exact quote, when he delivered in his famous speech in South Africa, when he talked about how if one person throws a pebble into the water and it sends out it sends out ripples. And if many people start throwing pebbles into the water, the ripples meet and then they combine. Thank you. All right. Then it was waiting here patiently. I just want to thank our speakers again. Thanks for your PowerPoint. That was very good. Thank you for what you're doing. I'll be eclectic as usual. First of all, I want to begin on a totally off-topic thing. Uh, there's been something I sent around and be certain to wear a politically correct Halloween costume <laughs> on Halloween. I hope you won't dress up as an Indian or a squad. They're saying avoid such costumes or geisha girls are not, you know, appropriate. Anyhow, um, I, I don't know if many of you are aware of this. There's a, an acronym NGO, 
and non-government organizations. Uh, and they, there are a multitude of these, such as the One Campaign, uh, to try to have some effect in the global community. Um, if it's one way of keeping abreast of what's going on in other parts of the world. Uh, if there's any number I could recommend, like the UN Association, just to get their emails or publications. Another one I've been a member for a number of years called Global Solutions, uh, which was a UN type group. It's a little quiet right now, but uh, you get some a different perspective on what's going on in the world. And there's any number of organizations, Oxfam you mentioned, and others like this, that operate within the global community. And it's a good idea to attend their events if they're a fair trade type organizations. Uh, you get an idea of what's going on in the world besides uh, your neighborhood. Um, one of the things about poverty that I came across during the week that disturbed me, and I guess this is a popular approach or attitude that they have, at least in Fox News and these commentators on the radio, is that you should not help people who are impoverished because, the way I got it, you would create dependency. Oh. So really, you should not, you actually should not help them. Now, I don't know if that's quite the approach that I would take. Now, um, there's one thing about isolationism. There's no argument that can defeat isolationism as being less complex or less fraught with any problems or right or wrong. Uh, don't even attempt to try. Uh, isolationism is also always going to be the simplest. However, it's not by any means realistic. And I always point out to people who tell me that they are isolationists and we should not be too concerned about what's going on in the rest of the world, I always ask them, where did that shirt you're wearing come from? Um, we are, in fact, living in a global community, especially, Tim has told us many times, with communication, uh, certainly, and certainly with travel, within 24 hours you can be in any part of the world. It's no longer, the world is, is shrunk and these, that's what I mean, even some of these nation state concepts, sooner or later are not going to have any relevance because such as take trade, I deal in transportation. No doubt all of any of you have seen these intermodal, intermodal containers that are shipped all over the world, here and there and whatever, in thousands. The volume of them is just inconceivable if you've been on some of the coastal ports. And as I have seen the train after train of these things, and to say that we're going to remain uh, in an isolationist mode is just not realistic. It's just not even, even worth approaching. Now, you mentioned Singapore, Tim. And I know, I think you were just trying to say Asia. And if you think what, we should, what they should do in other parts of the world is what's going on in Asia, I think you're crazy. <laughs> I mean, I've given slideshows here showing what those factories are and what they're doing. I mean, with children making plastic shit for Walmart. If you think that is something that should be replicated in the rest of the world, I've got to say this stops do whatever we can. I hope the one campaign stops that from happening. They're replicating it anywhere. Um, let's see, jumping, what else? Uh, the, the thing about, oh, you, you, you wanted to do legislative work. And I've been working the Hill for many, many years. It's a very tough topic because many of these Congressmen, unfortunately, only know what's going on in their district. So you come in with these global things, and once in a while you get somebody who's got 
is, is something wide awake and can realize these are serious issues and concerns, but it's a tough one. It's really hard if you take something, it's like saying, you know, like environmental issues are, are, are difficult because they can't relate it. All they know is the boundaries of their district here. Now my friend Raj, you find it impossible that we, can, we can't get people jobs? If you've never heard of the jobs bill? <laughs> We've had instances where virtually everyone in the United States was employed and had good jobs right in this own country. It's going on all over the place. This is, a, this is an inconceivable... I, I don't understand. In human arrangements, we can do all kinds of things and we can certainly accomplish this. Now, if you're going to have some narrow scope thinking people in charge, yeah, you're never going to have it, but if you have progressive people like me, it probably wouldn't take very long. Now, another thing I got to talk about, I've been a union official, probably serving for a great many years, and my union has nothing, no resemblance whatsoever, Brahm, to a church. <laughs> we are so far removed from being a church, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> we have nothing. If you want to call what we're doing theology, that's a real stretch. Um, but anyhow, thanks a lot for giving us some information on this thing, really, and uh, come again and bring us an update. And everybody should sign up and help them along. It'd be a good idea. At least get their emails. Thank you. Well, thank you for the presentation. And uh, this group has a real unique place to play in society, as you might have already guessed. But I think one of the things that is very interesting about, about uh, the College of Complexes is, is it really is a place where people come and really work on um, learning. Learning, I, th I think, is an adult learning experience and um, expressing themselves. Um, I, I, I obviously do not agree with a lot of the things that some people say. But uh, regardless of that, it's always um, good to not to be preaching to the choir, but be preaching to people who oppose your opinion, and it makes you a little bit sharper in what you uh, think about what you think about. So uh, having said that, um, I do appreciate your presentation. You really didn't show me that you actually do anything. <laughs> <But> <laughs> How about that? Anyway, and um, however, I can see the the um, the usefulness of people becoming involved in educating themselves on what's going on. So I suppose, in that sense, um, you you probably have some kind of a role to play, and um, it, it, you kind of did not demonstrate that tonight. But you know, the night is young. Um, and then the, the last thing is that Andy really rolled over me again. And, um, no. <laughs> well, I just would like to correct a couple things that he said. Uh, first of all, the, um, the test for AIDS never has been for the AIDS virus. It never has been for the AIDS virus. And so anyone that tells you, unless it's a specific thing like a viral load test, which is not usually done, <coughs> the AIDS test is for the antibodies to the AIDS virus, not for the AIDS virus like he stated in his uh, presentation. The second thing is AZT, uh, it, it, before AZT was used in pregnant women, and, and I'm sorry, I don't know the percentages and all this jazz, but there was a real, um, there was a, 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 a significant level of transmission of AIDS from the mother to the fetus. After the use of AZT, there is, there, the, that transmission level has been reduced to almost zero. In fact, I think it is zero in the last research studies. And that AZT is not a deadly drug if it is used appropriately. And that both the infant and the mother survived 
the use of AZT during pregnancy. And that is, a, yeah, anyway, that, that's a fact. So um, I think that uh, what happened is whoever's done these articles, and some of the articles that I got from Andy about specific researchers, it's like, you know, you, a wagon was hitched to the wrong star, that the researchers that deny the existence of AIDS and deny the existence of the HIV virus as, as the causative agent for AIDS are people who have significant ulterior motives. They're producing their own medication, which has nothing to do with HIV, or they're somehow profiting from, um, from creating doubt about what's happening with HIV. Um, people that are just, uh, I don't know, deluded or something, so I think uh, the people who originally supported this before 1996 were people who supported it, and then after the mid-90s, when it was demonstrated scientifically that the human immunovirus causes acquired immune deficiency syndrome, and that was demonstrated scientifically, most of those scientists fell off the wagon about supporting the view that Andy is, um, has been saying has been supported by the um, articles and the things. And so the, the, the reason it's underreported is because it's bullshit. <laughs> in short, in my opinion. So, um, you know, that's, that's it, 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 it overwhelming scientific evidence by noted experts and people who have made this their life study. An overwhelming number of physicians and scientists support the idea that HIV causes AIDS. And the people who don't support that idea are a real minority who have no legitimacy in the medical community. So that's my little piece for, for Andy. And uh, most of the time, most of the things that he hitches his wagon to, I'm very supportive of. I agree with all his things about anti-nuclear things and stuff like that. But I'm, I'm and, but I'm really, and, but I don't agree with him about several things, and this uh, this particular issue is one of them. Thank you. If there are no other speakers tonight, let's have our main speaker give the last word. You have until 11 o'clock. If you want to shut off early, that's fine. But I'll keep it brief. The however you want to take it from there is fine. And uh, let's thank our speakers again for an excellent presentation. I want to thank everyone again for giving me the chance to come here today and uh, speak in this very, very engaging, uh, intellectually and stimulating uh, forum. So it's been a real, real pleasure. Um, I actually want to start off uh, these comments with more of a personal appeal. Up until now, I've mostly been talking about the statistics and, the, the, and what the One Campaign does. I touched in the talk a little bit on the moral argument for why we should care about these issues. And I raise an argument based on uh, if we were to find a child drowning in a pond and we were able to wade in and save that child, then I am sure that all of us would be more than willing to do so, even if it involved some personal discomfort. Most of, most of the concerns, I think, that have been raised, which are rightfully raised, is about questions of, okay, yes, we want to save the drowning infant, but can we? Um, can we really make any change? Can we really get around the politicians? So I want to slightly modify the uh, thought experiment and let us imagine that we have this infant uh, about to drown in this pond and you're going, you're trying to go save the infant and a politician gets in the way and says, well, sir, you need a permit in order to get into that pond and you're frustrated by that, so you try to get a permit and then there's, there's red tape and there's all sorts of problems at getting access to the pond. So basically, your efforts to try to save this drowning child are being thwarted by incompetent politicians and, and laws and so forth that are stopping you from doing what is clearly the, clearly the moral thing to do, which is to save this child. Um, I think that all of us would do the best we could to figure out a solution, to figure out a way to work with the politicians, to work around them, to work around the situation, whatever we can do to save the child. So <clears throat> the same principle should apply when it comes to figuring out the 
uh, the foreign aid problem. I totally grant and uh, admit that these are complex issues. But the stakes are so high because uh, we talk about, I talk about stats, uh, for example, about the 600,000 plus that died from malaria. But each one of those is a child drowning in a pond. And so if we really consider the human toll um, that is out there, I think that it can help us to realize that um, we need to work as hard as we can to figure out what the solutions are. And I may or may not have all the correct answers. I'm sure I do not have all the right answers. But hopefully this moral argument can get us to recognize how important it is for us to figure out the solution and to take it seriously. If we allow ourselves to, um, to just give up with cynicism and, and leave the child drowning in the pond, I think it's something that at the end of the day we'll all regret that we took that path. So that was my uh, personal appeal about the importance of this issue. Um, I want to address just a couple of concerns that were raised, uh, or issues that were raised. Um, one thing uh, that commonly came up, and I, I agree with this to a large extent, was the idea of getting a job as a way out of poverty. And I am very much in favor of, of uh, capitalistic types of uh, economies. I'm very much in favor of the free market. I'm actually quasi-libertarian in my own political ideology. Uh, <laughs> quasi. <laughs> I'm, I'm a complex political creature. but. Uh, I, I, so I totally agree that it's very important for people to be able to get a job, to be able to produce in uh, society. And that's why I think we've made a lot, a lot of strides in our development and the effectiveness of foreign aid, because a lot of programs now do take us into account. Uh, these programs are not just about handouts uh, that create dependency, but about creating the environment and the situation in which flourishing can occur, including uh, getting jobs. We've talked uh, already about, for example, the number of children that are now able to go to school because of these programs. Well. Children getting an education has a direct impact on the on the jobs they're able to, to um, participate in and, and the amount of productivity they're able to contribute to their society. Um, so I do think that we should recognize that job production is an extremely critical issue and has to be part of the development agenda, uh, and a major part. Uh, and so that has to be kept in mind. There was also a, a concern briefly mentioned about population growth. And um, I thought that this might be an issue that was more prominently raised um, even during the initial question and answer period. But I do want to say a couple notes about uh, the issue with population growth. Uh, first of all, I think it is critical to note that we actually do have enough food production currently to handle everybody on the globe. And in fact, everybody could have 20, uh, 2,700 calories worth of uh, consumption every day uh, given current food production. So thus, all of us could actually get fat with the amount of food that's produced um, in the world. So it's really just a distribution issue regarding um, getting these calories to those who need them most. So the, the Malthusian prediction that the population explosion is going to create some sort of problem supporting people both from a resource standpoint but also from a job standpoint has not proved correct. And the primary reason for this is because people are not simply consumers. People are not simply consumption machines but are actually producers. And every new individual, especially an individual who's given a good environment, raised in a loving home, given an education, can actually produce solutions and solve problems. Uh, so we need to get outside the mode of thinking that individuals are simply all consuming and, and tearing down our planet. Rather, people can all contribute to solving these global problems. And that's why technology has helped us so far already in reducing the amount of pain and suffering uh, that we experience and dramatically improving life, uh, life expectancy and, and so forth. Um, so the other issue to, to note is that um, there's generally speaking, well, there's a very strong trend towards lower, uh, lower sized families uh, uh, among the wealthy. So actually, development programs not only help to bring people out of poverty and save lives, they also help to stabilize the population. If you actually look at all, almost all developed economies, um, they have very low birth rates compared to the um, underdeveloped nations. So I think for all of these reasons, uh, population growth is not really a concern, but rather um, we should be very uh, confident that development programs can help us to both stabilize the population and to make sure everybody has enough food to eat and jobs to be productively employed with. Um, so one other issue I wanted to address was the uh, question of whether anything is, is really being done. And I'm not 100% sure. Well, there's several ways this question could be took, taken. 
You could say, well, are there actually actions being taken as far as are there uh, political messages going out? So are there, are there letters being sent to senators and congresspersons? Are there phone calls being made? Are there in district meetings happening? And, and there are, and there are quite a few. I've been involved in some, um, not as many as I should be, I'm sure, but uh, I've been involved in quite a few. And because of the size and scope of the organization, we do have a huge volume of messages that are um, received by political leaders. So the actual amount of productive output from the one campaign, uh, if measured by the amounts of contacts made to political representatives about uh, the fact that we care about these issues, I would say that we are doing quite a bit. The more com complicated question would be whether or not those things are having any impact. And that is indeed a hard question to answer. I do think we can look at some case studies that uh, indicate that advocacy has played a role. It's impossible, however, to establish absolute 100% certainty of causation in something as complicated as advocacy when you're talking about a very complicated political global system. So I don't want to overstate the case and say that we know uh, that this or that bill was passed because of this or that advocacy action or this or that postcard that was sent to this or that senator. Uh, we can't get down to that level of uh, understanding because uh, such a thing is, is virtually impossible to do. Uh, we can, all, the, all we can do is the best that we can do. And uh, that's why I want to get back, well, actually I want to for the last, the last point that I raised, to talk about the issue of uh, optimism. And so there are kind of two extremes that we can we can go to. We can go to uh, naivete or idealism. And probably I uh, err on the side of idealism, as you may think from this presentation and, and so forth. Um, and clearly, uh, idealism can seem far-fetched. But also, um, we, don't want to, we don't want to get into an extreme of, of thinking that things are hopeless. Because uh, usually extremes are not accurate. So if I think that, for example, when we are talking about whether or not politicians actually care about issues and if they can ever make any sort of effective change, we could either say, uh, well, politicians, every single one of them is absolutely the worst. They are the worst human beings in the world. They never do anything good, and they only care about themselves. Uh, and that would be one extreme that could be taken, but it's unlikely to be true. Usually, life is more subtle than those kinds of extremes. Uh, it, will, it would also be extreme to come up here and be an idealist and say, all politicians are just doing the best they can. They uh, never make any uh, moral mistakes. Uh, you know, <laughs> they're, they're all just a bunch of, of, of great people doing excellent work in all cases. The reality lies somewhere in, in the middle of those two extremes. But I think it's so important that we don't go to the extreme of assuming that there is no hope that uh, our actions will make no impact, that politicians will never do anything good, uh, if only because of that personal appeal that I mentioned at the beginning. The stakes are so high. Uh, perhaps it's true. Perhaps this world is a, is a depressing place where the red tape and the rules and the politicians get in the way of us saving the drowning infant. But I would say that if there's any chance, any hope, that we can make a difference, that we can save that infant, then we should do everything we can to do so. And so that uh, concludes my thoughts for the evening. Thanks again so much for having me. And I appreciate it. Thank you. 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 Thank you.